Today, we're gonna talk about three stocks that I don't currently own, but I plan on buying in 2019. And two of those stocks are actually stocks that I've never owned in my entire life. So I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. Let's go ahead and get started. What's up everybody? My name is Ale and welcome to my world of stocks. Now I know you guys like timestamps, so I left some for you down below in the comment section. All I ask in return is that if you enjoyed this video, please support the channel by hitting the like button. It really helps out a lot and I really appreciate it. Now today we'll be talking about three new stocks that I'm buying in 2019, but these should not be confused with my overall portfolio, which includes much larger positions in stocks like Disney, Microsoft, and several others. Instead, these are actually going to be tiny positions that I plan on adding to over time with a long-term dollar cost averaging strategy. And a big reason why is because, you know, we've been having a lot of market volatility and all the stocks in today's video are down huge and they can easily be considered falling knives. So I think it's best to use a slow kind of gradual approach with a lot of these stocks. But in any case, you should always do your own research and make your own decisions just like any other video. Don't buy a stock just because you watch a YouTube video, make your own decisions. But uh, let's go ahead and get started with stock number three. All right, guys, starting things off here, we've got AT&T, ticker symbol T. Now this is a stock that we talked about recently on the channel and I did a full analysis on it. So if you wanna check out that video, I'll have it up here or in the description. But this stock, I used to feel pretty bearish about AT&T and lately I've been becoming more and more bullish for the long term as the stock continues to go down in price. Speaking of which, they're down almost 12% in the past five years, down almost 20% in the past year, and down around 23% from their 52 week high, at one point even dipping below $27 a share. Now before we go any further, I have to be honest with you guys and admit that I already started buying this stock below $30 a share, and that's really where I feel the most comfortable buying the stock. But I am hoping that this market volatility continues, or even better would be if we get that market crash that all the fortune tellers are predicting, because I'd love to add more shares in that lower price range. But if it never comes, then I may continue buying even in the $30 range, but I can guarantee you that it will be in much smaller amounts because at that point it would really start hurting my average cost basis, which again right now is under 30. Also, this is the only stock out of the three that I've already started buying, whereas the other two I still need to jump into. In any case, the stock is still trading at a pretty attractive valuation with a PE ratio of just six, a PEG ratio of 1.3, a PS ratio of 1.3, a PB ratio of 1.2, and it's still under their 200 day moving average, but a little higher than their 50 day moving average. So why am I interested in AT&T as a long-term investment? Well, for one, they're a really good dividend stock, and I've been trying to become more disciplined with my overall portfolio by adding some dividend stocks and especially dividend growth stocks, which I also made a video on recently, but I wouldn't really consider AT&T much of a growth stock for reasons that we'll get into in just a second. But what AT&T does have is a massive dividend yield of 6.7% and an even more impressive growth history of 34 years. That is just massive. And that means that AT&T has not only paid dividends every single one of those years, but they've actually increased those dividends even through recessions and times of economic hardships. But a couple issues here keeping AT&T from being a true dividend growth stock is that the payout ratio is a little high at 57%. It's not too bad, but it, it is a little up there. And that five year growth rate is really low. However, don't pay any attention to this negative 3% that is listed here. It looks like the Seeking Alpha website may have glitched because that growth rate is definitely positive, but it's still low and probably around two to 3%. But as far as the business goes, I do think that there's some potential growth catalyst that could bring AT&T up out of the stagnant business model that they've implemented in the past, which resulted in seven straight quarters of revenue decline. That is not a good sign. Now this was mostly due to AT&T's landline telecom business and their direct TV subscription TV services since people are really moving away from those in favor of wireless telecom, especially prepaid versus contract, and as more people figuratively cut the cable cord in favor of video on demand services like Netflix, Hulu, or even Amazon. So those things have been hurting AT&T's business. In fact, AT&T lost 346,000 subscribers in traditional TV this past quarter alone, 
but actually gained 49,000 net subscribers on their DirecTV Now service, which is more of a streaming service. And the good news for AT&T is that both of those areas of their business have some new growth catalysts. When looking at telecom, AT&T stands to benefit tremendously from upcoming 5G technologies, which they've invested heavily in to build their 5G infrastructure, and we could start seeing 5G services rolled out as early as later this year. And that may lead to the next smartphone super cycle, as well as provide even more growth in areas like the internet of things market, including connected homes and especially connected cars and autonomous driving. On top of that, their wireless revenue still jumped by 5% this last quarter year over year with prepaid ads of over half a million. Postpaid ads was much lower at just 69,000, but that's still a good sign considering how much people are shifting away from contracts. Now the other area of transition for AT&T is their shift away from traditional subscription television two more on-demand video streaming services. And their recent acquisition of Time Warner is a huge play on that, as they do plan to launch their own streaming service in 2019 to compete with the likes of Netflix, Amazon, and Disney. In fact, the acquisition gives them the rights to a host of entertainment content, including Turner, Warner Brothers, and even HBO. This includes television and movie content from networks and brands like Cartoon Network, CNN, TNT, TBS, Warner Brothers Pictures, New Line Cinema, Castle Rock, and the list goes on. Not to mention that this also includes the DC Universe with hugely popular brands and content from Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, and the rest. So you're potentially talking about a really jam-packed streaming service here that can definitely give Netflix a run for their money as long as AT&T doesn't screw it up. But the Time Warner deal seems to already be helping as this past quarter was the first quarter to include Time Warner and they were able to finally report positive year-over-year -year revenue growth of 0.2% on a pro forma basis, which includes Time Warner in the prior year quarter as well. And Warner Media was actually their highest growth segment at over 6%, while a few other segments actually saw significant declines. Yes, that is tiny revenue growth and it's barely positive, but again, this is coming off of seven straight quarters of negative revenue growth, and you have to keep in mind that it's going to take time for AT&T to transition from a failing business model to one that has real potential. So couple those new growth catalysts with that really high dividend and the falling share price, and I think AT&T is starting to look more and more attractive. Now, I do have a feeling that they're gonna continue to struggle in the short term, given that more people are cutting the cord, both with cable television and like legacy landlines in the telecom uh, you know, industry. So there may be some struggling there still, but as AT&T transitions, I think in the long term, there is some real potential here. Okay guys, moving on to stock number two, we've got the high performance GPU king, Nvidia, ticker symbol NVDA. Now this is the only stock on the list that I did actually own in the past for a short amount of time, but it was really just a, like a short term trade because I bought the stock, it went up a lot, I cashed in some profits, and I never really touched it again. And so it was really more of a short term trade rather than a long term investment, which is what I'm now trying to start with Nvidia. Now they're currently down over 35% in the past year, but still up around 750% in the past five years, which is pretty insane. However, the recent drop from their 52 week high is over 50%, which may represent a buying opportunity for the long term, considering that they used to trade for almost $300 a share, but are now down to just the $130 range. Now, as far as why they've dropped by so much, it has a lot to do with cryptocurrency, and we really saw the same thing happen to AMD. See, many crypto miners used AMD and NVIDIA GPUs for mining purposes, which increased their revenue substantially. But after crypto prices dropped, people stopped mining cryptocurrencies because it wasn't as profitable. So this left a lot of uh, like secondhand GPUs out in the market. And despite Nvidia having a great earnings last quarter where they saw revenue jump 20% and Gap EPS jump almost 50% year over year with record revenue in their data center, professional visualization, and automotive segments, and they even raised their dividend by another 7%, all eyes were on guidance and Nvidia failed to deliver. In fact, analysts were looking for $3.4 billion in revenue with a year over year increase of 17% for the following quarter, but Nvidia guided much lower at just 2.7 billion, 
which is actually a decrease of around 7%. So the stock tanked immediately following the news and it's been struggling ever since. And of course the lower guidance is due to crypto mining as the CEO is on record saying, our near term results reflect excess channel inventory post the cryptocurrency boom. And when looking at how long this excess inventory will last, their CFO said, we expect to work down channel inventories over the next quarter or two. So in my opinion, this does represent a great opportunity for someone like me who still hasn't purchased the stock. You're talking about possibly two quarters of disappointing sales in a very volatile market, so that's really hammering the stock and making it much cheaper. But in the long term, this is an issue that should come and go, and when it does, I could see Nvidia thriving in other high growth markets like data center, autonomous driving, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. All of these markets will demand higher and higher performance from graphics cards that Nvidia specializes in. Now I went into huge detail about the different things that Nvidia is doing in those markets in a previous video that I made. So I'll have it linked uh, down in the description if you wanna see like a full analysis. But some news that we just received from CES 2019 is that Nvidia is now launching their new 2060 GPU which is going to run for around $350 and is going to be their budget offering for their Turing based cards. Again, we have to sell through those Pascal based cards like the 1060, 1070 and 1080 cards, but combine this, uh, combine this new 2060 with their already cheaper 2070 and you're talking about some very high performance cards that are capable of ray tracing at much more affordable prices. Granted, ray tracing is still a new technology that isn't fully utilized yet by too many developers, uh, and that's also helped fuel the huge sell-off of the stock. But the point is that Nvidia is a high growth stock that in my opinion is being spit on by Wall Street because of some short term issues that should completely disappear in the future. Speaking of which, the markets that Nvidia competes in, in my opinion, are the future and Nvidia is going to play a huge role in all of that technology. Not to mention that while you're waiting for those markets to really take off, you get to collect a growing dividend in the meantime. Now their yield is laughably low at less than 0.5%, but give this a decade or so, and this could turn into a pretty nice dividend when you consider that their payout ratio is extremely low at less than 10%, and their five year growth rate is in the double digits. So I definitely consider Nvidia a dividend growth stock. Okay guys, last but not least here, we've got the third stock that I'm picking up in 2019, and that's Alibaba, ticker symbol BABA. -A. And the reason I'm interested in this stock is because the combination of China's economy slowing down, along with the trade fight between the US and China, has destroyed a stock that should arguably be trading much higher if market conditions were stable. Now they're still up over 60% in the past five years, but they're down about 25% in the past year and down over 30% from their 52 week high of over $200 per share, but have now been trading in the $130 range. And most recently they jumped up to the $140 range, but I gotta admit, I do like them much more in the $130 range if I can get it, which I'm hoping will be possible if this market volatility continues here throughout 2019. In any case, I'm bullish on Alibaba in the long term for several different reasons. Number one is that you're getting one of the largest e-commerce players in the world and arguably the most important one in China, although JD.com is definitely up there with them. But the great thing about Alibaba is that even just within the e-commerce market, they're pretty well diversified because they're not just a business to consumer company, but they're also heavily involved in consumer to consumer operations, as well as business to business, because many companies, especially in the US, buy products in bulk on Alibaba's platform from Chinese manufacturers and then sell them for a premium. So you could argue that Alibaba is not necessarily a competitor to something like Amazon, but more so that they're a very important component to the entire supply chain. So I think of Alibaba as like a mixture of eBay and Amazon and a few other things that make it this huge player in the global e-commerce market, which by the way, still has a tremendous amount of growth left since only around 12% of global retail sales are currently done online. Not to mention that they have a huge domestic market to tap into in China as well. See their e-commerce market is projected to grow from around 1 trillion 
this year to around 1.8 trillion in 2022, and currently less than 40% of the Chinese population even shop online at all. Don't forget that China's population is somewhere close to 1.4 billion people, so that's a huge market, and as of June 2018, Alibaba controlled over 50% of the Chinese e-commerce market. So the way I see it, Baba is already dominating, but the crazy thing is that they still have a ton of room to grow in the future. Not to mention that the Chinese retail market in general is expected to grow to over $7 trillion by 2020, and Alibaba is already trying to take full advantage of that by investing heavily in what they call new retail, where they are upgrading brick and mortar stores and providing them with data analytics, online shopping features, and helping them survive in exchange for integrating Alibaba services and giving them modest stakes in their companies. On top of that, Alibaba is a huge play on the cloud services market as they're currently the second largest cloud services provider in the Asia Pacific region, only behind Amazon, and they're the fourth largest in the world, only behind Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. All of this success has led to total revenue growth in their last quarter of over 50% and cloud revenue growth of 90% year over year. Those are some really high growth rates. So the way I see it, Alibaba is this huge, you know, e-commerce cloud services provider giant that is really being brought down because of some negative news like the, uh, you know, China's uh, economy slowing down and the trade fight between the U.S. and China. But, you know, I think those things will get solved eventually over time. You know, the economy slowing down in China, that might be a little bit of a bigger concern. But I think the whole trade fight between the U.S. and China eventually gets resolved at some point. And in reality, this is still a company that is performing very well despite these negative things, right? Still growing at huge percentages. Um, so I kind of just want to take advantage of the fact that it's being dragged down right now. Now, there are definitely some concerns with this stock that I already mentioned, but also the fact that it uses a VIE structure. So when you buy the stock, you're not actually buying the company, you're buying like a shell company that is entitled to like profits from the original company. It's kind of a complicated thing. I made a whole video on it. You can check it out somewhere up here. I'll have it linked in the description too. Uh, if you're gonna be investing in any Chinese company, I really recommend that you understand how the VIE structure works and maybe check out my video or check out somebody else's video and really understand how it works. But all in all, I am very bullish on Alibaba in the long term and I would like to hold the stock. Okay guys, I think that just about wraps it up here. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure you hit the like button. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you do so. And uh, I will see you in the next video. Stay safe out there. I wish you the best in uh, 2019 and with all your investments. And I'll catch you guys later. Take care, bye-bye.